check. Okay, Carl, um, for some reason it's sharing your screen. If you don't mind turning that off. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Sorry about yeah, that. When I click on the share screen for the presentation, it says you can't share your screen while someone else is sharing. Yeah. Carl, uh, can you hear me? I think he's only, this will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? So let me do continue so that it will turn his off. Okay, share screen, start now. So I'm gonna start mine just so Okay, we're gonna turn it back off. Stop share. Okay, here we go. Are is are you good now? I'm going to chat, but I believe so. Pretty good on my end now. Okay, I see you starting to do that. Just want to say welcome, everyone. Um, we we're trying to do a couple of webinars to help out our members during this time. Um, just kind of trying to figure things out, getting used to things, bringing in leaders who are dealing with these types of things that they can help um, our small businesses. So I'm very excited to have Logan Aluminum on the call today. Uh, David Houston, and he can uh, introduce his guest here in just a second. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the relentless journey to keeping our people safe. Um, and I know that Logan Aluminum, you guys were thinking of that probably a whole lot sooner than a lot of us um, other folks here in Logan County were thinking about that. So um, because y'all travel so much, you've got so many employees and you're the largest employer in Logan County. So with that being said, um, just want to make sure that any questions that you have, go ahead and chat those in. I'll be watching um, the chat function. Just hit the chat, chat button at the bottom or click more and there should be a chat. So send those questions to me and I'll make sure that they're answered um, as we go through the call. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you guys for being here with us today uh, and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Thank you, Karen. Um, it's uh, uh, an evolving wealth of knowledge. Let's put it that way. I suspect that we'll look, <laughs> we'll look back on it three or six months from now and say, look at how much we really learned and how much we didn't know because we're, uh, we're really jumping into this uh, feet first in, in areas that we, we plan for. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's a lot of new frontiers for us in this journey. So just a quick check to make sure that you all can see my screen. If I put, yeah, I, I can see it. If We're put good it, to go. you can still see that. So, okay, great. Well, let me uh, introduce the Logan team that's on the call, and then we'll jump into it and talk about our response to the COVID nineteen um, pandemic. Right. So, my name is David Fusting, and I am the human resource leader, human resource manager um, at Logan. I've been there for, I've been been here at Logan for ten months. Um, I'm just kind of worked in HR and lots, lots of different corporations. Um, but uh, very happy to move back home 10 months ago and uh, join the Logan family. It's, uh, as, as you all know, an incredible part of the community and an incredible workplace. So I uh, couldn't be happier to be here and, and get to know more and more people in the Logan, in the Russellville area as well. So I see some, some of the people that I've met and become friends with uh, on, on the call. That's me, so Van. Yeah, so I'm Van Mitchell. I'm the uh, Environmental Safety and Security Manager at Logan, and uh, I've been there for quite some time. I'm, I'm working on year 26. Uh, uh, I've worked in a lot of different roles throughout the plant. I've uh, 
worked in operations, started in operations, uh, been an operation, one of our unit managers in, in our remelt facility. And, uh, but my background and education's in uh, health and safety. So uh, uh, now currently serving as the uh, manager for environmental safety and security. And, and part of that is we'll talk about in a little bit is uh, my, my group is responsible for our crisis management program at Logan and, and how we implement that. So, so we'll, we'll talk more in details uh, but I'm glad to be on the call today and uh, uh, glad to share. But more importantly, hopefully you guys will see things that we're not doing that you can share with us. And, and we learn from others more than anything. So uh, yeah. we're, we're certainly not here to tell you we know how to do all this. Uh, we're learning our lessons daily. <laughs> so. Fantastic. And, and also want to acknowledge uh, one of our newer members that's on the call, uh, Judy. So Judy, you want to introduce yourself as well? Uh, sure. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Judy Roman Bukasa. I'm the communication specialist at Logan Aluminum. Um, started there in mid-January, so I'm a I'm a newbie. <laughs> but, and then and then this happened, and so we really had to pivot in in the way we needed to communicate with our with our employees. But um, uh, I have been working on um, internal communications, which is especially important during this time and. And um, you know, trying to trying to put out some uh, technology around being able to communicate with our employees as quickly and as uh, efficiently as possible. So, if you have any questions, please let me know. You have a beautiful background, Judy. <laughs> oh, thanks. I just that's cool. I'm, I'm that's missing. I'm missing. I'm missing the site right now. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So, just to kind of roll you back to how this journey began, at least for me, I can tell you that. It was early in early January. We're doing the usual kind of year end stuff, you know, wrapping up, you know, performance reviews and, you know, salary planning and just all the kind of HR stuff you do. And Van walks into my office and drops down a fairly thick document, says, You're probably going to want to read this. And I'm like, Well, what is this? And he says, You're a member of our pandemic, uh, pandemic crisis management team. And that's just another one of the duties that. That you probably didn't know about yet and I'm like oh okay so uh, so that was my introduction to given everything that was going on um, and it was very very early if you think back to January um, we were already and talk about management approach David, I think you're you're breaking up. You see slide. Hey, David, you cut it out. Says just my a internet bit. connection is. Yeah. Oh, I'm very sorry. About that. <laughs> is it? Um, let me move. But I'll turn it over to Van. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, take take us to our next slide there, and. Uh, uh, so, so like David said, we, Logan for years has had a uh, ma crisis management program, and and it's a it's a high level uh, overriding system. It's managed by the uh, uh, EHS uh, department at the plant, and uh, we drill on it routinely uh, for all different types of crises in the plant. And it, and it outlines uh, roles, responsibilities, and a structure for us to operate in uh, in, in times of crisis. And it's not specific to a pandemic. It's not specific to business interruption crises. It, it, it is broad and covers the spectrum of a lot of different things. Uh, but it, it gives us a path to narrow down to the specific issue that we're dealing with. So uh, Logan was in a situation where very early on uh, we, we were engaged in this, probably earlier than most, because as you know, we've got a lot of expansion going on at the plant. And a lot of our equipment, it comes, comes out of specifically Northern Italy, right in the heart of where Italy was hit, uh, our major supplier for mill equipment. So we had early on lots of Italians at the plant, uh, lots of uh, planned trips for people to go to Italy to review equipment and to do pre-startup reviews. Uh, so there was a lot of interaction with Logan and Northern Italy. Also, there was some with China as well, uh, not specifically the Wuhan uh, area of China, but, but China. So those spots were identified early and it forced us to start to take quick action uh, 
for things that weren't necessarily happening in the US but were affecting us significantly at the time. So, uh, so we activated uh, our crisis management uh, plan and specifically tailored it in for this pandemic. And uh, there are two, if you look at that slide, there were, there were two teams that we quickly identified. There was what we called the pandemic crisis management team, which was a high level, mostly managers, uh, includes our, our president, our, our plant manager, human resources, uh, my team with loss prevention and security and safety, as well as procurement and, uh, and our, uh, our CFO also sits on that team. So that was initiated early. And then we also had a, what we called a pandemic response team. This was made up of the leaders from our medical group, uh, from our, our human resource business partners. It, it's a more tactical team that addresses issues as they come up. So uh, that team was specifically, uh, as the pandemic crisis management team identified the process and we identified kind of the path and we made higher level business decisions, the pandemic response team carries those out. And that's, that's kind of how we were organized for this pandemic. But both groups were activated in January and mainly dealt initially with, uh, with the business interruption that we were gonna see from our expansion projects and, and interaction with overseas companies. So uh, we'll kind of go to the next slide. Uh, and again, this is just kind of, kind of high level, but uh, our, our, our precautions at a high level were just proactive and progressive steps. And then a lot of times kind of our philosophy was overreact and then we'll scale back uh, rather than, you know, uh, being behind the eight ball. We wanted to kind of overreact a little bit. So we'll talk in the following slides about a lot of things that we put in place from quarantining, social distancing, how we handle travel, there, there's lots of different pieces and parts that David and I will will share as we go through it. In general, for this pandemic, we've very closely followed CDC and and the governor, uh, the governor's advice from Kentucky. Additionally, we we have two owners. Logan has two owners, uh, Trials Aluminum and Novellus, and both of those had uh, pretty extensive crisis teams in place too. So. Uh, so, so we've been in contact with a, with a lot of folks. And, and again, we'll talk some more about that in detail as we move through. Let me, let me just add to that, if I could, Dan, that uh, I love the overact and scale back. That has been kind of a philosophy. And the other, the other thing that's been very important to us is to plan and anticipate, right? So be prepared. Uh, don't let anything hit us without us having not thought through our response to that in advance. So um, long before, or we had our first kind of potential, you know, scare in the plant. We had a multi-page document distributed to everyone saying, this is our reaction plan if this happens. And so when it happens, we just said, okay, let's go. We have a plan. Let's just execute it. And so for most of the things that have had, so we spent a lot of time sort of anticipating kind of where the governor's going and where this guidance is going. What does the phased recovery look like? What does that mean to us? And uh, it's kind of a, we, we kind of think about the series of steps we took to get into this and then reversing those steps and kind of walking back, you know, slowly but surely going back out of that. But it's a, the pandemic team spends a lot of time just trying to think ahead to not put us into a, a crisis mode. Just because there's a pandemic crisis going on doesn't mean that Logan gets into a crisis mode. Right. That's not very right. important. And I would say that one, the one, and we'll talk about this later, but the one time where we probably didn't move quickly enough on something, it created a little bit, <laughs> yeah. a little bit too much excitement, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but everything else, I, I think I can honestly say that everything else we've experienced in the last eight to 12 weeks has been things that we've anticipated and had plans in place for. So. Yep, very good. Yep. We'll go to the next slide there. Uh, so, so social distancing, right, critical. You, you hear a lot about that in the, in the media and from our authorities is the critical and importance of that. So we, we kind of moved into social distancing. Uh, first off, canceled all business travel to and from the plants and um, business meetings were canceled. The use of technology, virtual meetings that we've got almost 400 people working virtually or working from home uh, um, right now. Um, we don't really have visitors except for critical people that come for supplies and 
cafeteria workers and people like that. But uh, in terms of just, you know, salespeople calling on Logan or you know, people like that, that's just, that's all done virtually now. We also um, uh, talked about uh, travel to hotspots, right? So if you're taking vacation travel and you're going to a hotspot, we, uh, I'm not sure if this is in the presentation, but one of the things that we did is that we simply, we, we linked in with a travel agent that, that knows us well. And we simply told people that if you've booked a vacation and you're kind of in a pickle because you've got fees and you're worried, like, you know, our preference is that you stay healthy and safe. And so please work with our travel agent to get back, recoup what you can. And if you can't recoup it, Logan will help you on that. So we wanted everyone to feel comfortable that they weren't gonna, you know, have invested a thousand dollars in vacations and pre-advanced payments. And then they feel like they had to go. We wanted to, to put health and safety first. And so we try to make that easy for people to do that, especially as traveling into hot spots at, at the time. <laughs> Everything yeah. seems like it's become a hot spot now, right? But but back in the day, it was, you remember it was cruise travel, international travel, then it started getting into domestic travel and, and just continued to ramp up. So, uh, so flexible scheduling, so to keep the number of people on site down. So we're rotating, a lot of us, most of us, we're working remotely as a general rule unless we need to be in the plant, right? And so our, our management team in the uh, administration area, for example, we have a rotation that somebody's, a couple of us are there every day, but, but not all of us by, by any means. Uh, you see Van is at home today. I'm at home today. I'll, I'll be in tomorrow. And uh, because we've got, there's reasons for me to, to be there. It's the same thing with our, our medical staff. We have a couple of staff nurses, so they, they're alternating weeks. Uh, so every, every area of the business is looking at decreasing the number of people on site. And Van reports that on that daily in terms of the number of people on site. Because the fact of the matter is, if you take the same space and you put 12, 13, 1400 people in there as opposed to six or 700, it, it, it makes a difference. I mean, you, so we're taking very proactive measures in that regard. And, and then making it easier for people to take, to take care of themselves and their family. So pretty much um, a lot of freedom uh, for people to, to do what they need to do. We'll talk about our quarantine process in a minute. That's kind of a big part of that as well. If you have, essentially, if you have any concerns at all about the health and safety of you or a family member, we just ask you to, to bring those and to surface those and we'll deal with those in the right way. So, and our people have been uh, uh, phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. But you, just to finish on social distancing, I can remember um, the first time I walked in a plant and talked to people about social distancing. And this wasn't that long ago. What, six weeks ago? <laughs> you know, it's just it's amazing how you kind of get, the time is an amazing thing in this process, but uh, people looked at me and laughed at me, and I was like, "What are you? What the heck are you talking about?" Right? And and now, it is the norm. It's the it's our normal behavior, and we've instituted a number of things that you'll see uh, to facilitate social distancing. Um, all the kinds of things that you might read about, um, and we'll talk about those in just a bit. So. So, so temperature monitoring, uh, one of the proactive things we did very early on, actually early February, uh, realized that temperature screening was going to be a, a significant part of what we did, and we were able to uh, jump ahead of the curve a little bit. We, we bought these, uh, these individual oral thermometers for all of our employees uh, and got, them, got those in and got them to the employees early. Uh, asked every employee, our expectation was you'll check your temperature every time before you come into the plant. Uh, at the same time, our pandemic response team was working with vendors to purchase uh, a, a more permanent solution. Uh, we wanted something that was hands-free that did not expose other people, specifically our security or loss prevention staff, uh, to people having to take temperatures. And Logan has a lot of gates and a lot of places where we had to had to take temperatures. You know, we still we still were making product. We still had truck drivers and hundreds of trucks a day coming on and off the site. We still had critical uh, uh, contractors and visitors, although we had made significant reductions. And then we still had, you know, six or 700 employees a day uh, coming, you know, or, or actually more than that, but per shift probably coming in and out of the plant. So we had a lot of work to do at all our gates. And we started just by having an expectation of self monitoring. And so, we found that these little oral thermometers were really cheap. 
Uh, and honestly, we didn't find them. David's group did a good job. They found these and they actually found them through a promotion company that does, uh, you know, little engraving. People give things away like safety award companies and stuff. And that's where we actually found these and we're able to get a few thousand of them and get them out to our employees. Then we found a company in, out of Texas, uh, ICI, that, that does uh, thermal imaging and uh, temperature screening. So we were able to set up more permanent systems that our employees can walk through very fast. The systems, uh, I think we sent some info out to the chamber uh, or, or maybe through, it was through Bowling Green Chamber on these systems and all the details of them. But uh, if you're a fairly good sized company and you want to screen a lot of people fast and efficiently and not have to have a person man the system for about $14,000, you can set this up. And it, it honestly, for us, it, it's going to pay itself back and not having to have additional security staff. So, uh, so if you want info on those, I certainly can get that info to you. Uh, just uh, send it to Karen or, or reach out to us and let us know, but uh, certainly willing to share. It's turned out to be a very good system. We've ended up having about nine of them to be able to handle our gates uh, at different places. And uh, so uh, very happy with, with how we're doing that. So now, and, and we did not replace the expectation that people will check their own temperature. So we still have an expectation that all everyone coming on our site will check their own temperature, check themselves for signs and symptoms. We did a lot of training around that, but we also check additionally uh, at the plant before 100% every, everyone who comes on site. So next slide. <clears throat> Uh, additionally, uh, and I'll talk about this at the end when we talk about lessons learned, uh, and, that, and one of those is having relationships established with, your, with core key contractors for a crisis, but one of those is cleaning. And uh, fortunately with Logan, we have a very, very progressive and very good cleaning contractor on site, uh, uh, 4M. And uh, so early on, they were able to get uh, some of their cleaning staff trained to do high risk cleaning. Uh, and that's what we have used if we have uh, uh, not employees who test positive necessarily, but employees who suspect they have a symptom or that we have quarantined for some other reason and they might have been in the plant. 4M has been responsive 24 seven to go in and do deep cleaning of those areas. Additionally, they have trained and produced videos for us uh, to train our folks on how to do what I'll call non-high risk cleaning, uh, but but still using antibacterial and places. Uh, so so we're expecting our crane cabs, our fork trucks, our control rooms. I mean, it's a huge plant. Uh, so we had to engage a lot of people on how to do cleaning. And uh, this has worked out really well for us. And primarily because we already had an, a relationship established with, the, with a good company. And uh, so whether you have them on site or not, I think a lesson learned is know who you're going to use in a case like this. Uh, have a relationship before the pandemic, <laughs> before the crisis gets here with a good cleaning company because it's, it's super critical uh, in a lot of cases. Next slide. Uh, and, and there was a bullet on there about face masks, but I think we have a slide coming up that we're going to talk about face masks specifically. So. Uh, some other things we did, uh, you know, Logan has a big cafeteria that, that feeds all of our people. Uh, uh, we have a, another very good contractor that, that runs that cafeteria, Taher, and they were able quickly, you know, we had to close that cafeteria down. Uh, certainly couldn't have people sitting or congregating. They went to a, uh, like a, like a fast food drive through uh, uh, service really quickly. And, you know, we certainly reduced our menu. We had one option available. Uh, Logan made a decision that we were just going to pay for that and, and supply that to our employees so that we didn't have to deal with money transactions and all that kind of stuff. So uh, they were able to bag sack lunches uh, and get those out around the clock for, for all our employees and uh, even delivered out to some of the units in some cases. So uh, an excellent job by those folks to be able to feed our folks on so who were our, our critical employees who were on site. Again, employees came up with good ideas. I mean, things like tow pools, anything not to have to touch a door, uh, they, they put these things on. They came up with, you know, putting X's on. I mean, just little things that everybody I'm sure is doing. Uh, the thing I wanna to, to highlight here is the engagement of the employees coming up with these. Uh, the pandemic team, there's no way 
we could come up with all these things for a plant this size if we didn't have the engagement of all the employees. So, so that was a key piece. They were, they were empowered and felt like they could go out and implement something and do it and, and share it. And they did. So uh, they came up with the misters, right? I mean, the, Mister, they, the queen to, to be able to spray the, you know, uh, the, the bacteria uh, cleaning solution, antibacterial solutions. Uh, just a lot of, you know, our firefighters on site came up with ways to incorporate sprayers with their air packs so that they could go out and, and, and be mobile and spray buggies and vehicles and just clean stuff and uh, uh, just good engagement. So well, that's been fantastic. I'll, I'll just I'll just add to that with the cafeteria. I mean, it's so critical, critical that people eat. But by the same time, we it's a good, fairly good sized staff there. So making sure that their protocols are daily protocols to ensure that no one comes into work. And then, I mean, that's the fastest way to, to get, you know, spread the coronavirus very rapidly as if a cafeteria worker had it. So um, I'm, we check and we recheck their procedures and they're very solid. They're doing a great job. Yep. Um, uh, let's see. So suppliers and contractors, that, that, that is a big part of uh, our crisis program is, is the involvement. We have a lot of contractors uh, on a normal pre-pandemic day, uh, you know, five, 600 contractors is not uncommon. More than that, sometimes with all the expansion going on. So, uh, so we quick, we, we have good uh, relationships and, and reporting structures with our contractor managers who are on site and uh, also with suppliers, key suppliers. The aluminum business, some of you that are in it know that a lot of alloying materials, a lot of different things that we get that are critical to our business come from overseas. So uh, making sure supply chains stayed in place was was very critical uh, early on. And uh, that work began pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, we uh, I talked about the cafeteria, that bullet. Uh, talked about the... Uh, the tow pulls, thermometers, all that stuff. We, we, we were able to, to uh, work with some contacts we had at some of the bourbon distilleries. Some of you have probably done the same thing. But, uh, you know, we, we were able to get drums, uh, 800 plus gallons of uh, sanitizer in uh, pretty quick. It, it smelled funny. <laughs> smelled like bourbon a little bit, but hey, it worked. Uh, it worked really well and uh, certainly met a need that, that we were struggling with. Uh, so, uh, I think most of those other things. Oh, and, uh, and I think the thing to say about that too is that we, we make that available. Uh, we put it out in the entryway and uh, everybody can bring their own containers in and fill up and take it home with them. I mean, that's really, really critical. I mean, I keep a spray bottle in my car, keep one in my wife's car, we keep one in the house and all because of Logan, right? That, that provided that for us, so. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay, it's all right. Yeah, so am I up, man, on this one? I, I, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll do it because you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, okay. Everybody, I'm sure, is talking about masks and facial coverings. I mean, it's, it's the hot topic right now. Uh, we, Lo, Logan took an approach early on. Uh, uh, we, we don't have a one-size-fits-all solution for masks and facial coverings. We have areas in the plant where there are, are hazards around certain types of materials. So things uh, like polyesters are, uh, uh, you know, we have to be only cotton or, or there are certain things. So we were very uh, flexible with facial coverings. One, we encouraged employees to bring their own if they want to. We didn't care if it was a bandana, anything that could be used as a facial covering, we were good with it. Uh, at the same time, we supplied procedural masks. Uh, what I didn't talk about earlier, part of also part of our pandemic, our, our crisis, uh, our crisis management program, is that we stockpile material or supplies for a pandemic, and that's something we've done ever since SARS, uh, H1N1, sometime back. If you guys remember, we, we keep a pretty substantial supply of uh, pandemic supplies. So we were ahead of the game with uh, N95 masks, things like that. And we didn't, we didn't deploy those out into the plant just simply because the need for healthcare was, was so, uh, you know, healthcare needed these so bad. So we ended up donating uh, all, most all of our N95 masks to, uh, to, to various 
you know, groups, healthcare groups and responders around the area. We kept a few for our medical and our ambulance service on site. Uh, so we, we allowed employees to wear their own masks. We allowed bandanas. Uh, we provided procedural masks. Uh, you know, you've seen the little ones like a, like a, a dental hygienist would wear or something like that. Uh, and th that's what we put out for all of our employees to wear. We did not make it mandatory uh, in, in the beginning. We're starting to change some of that with some of the new guidance that's coming out. Uh, but uh, initially it was, we wanted people to social distance and that was the primary goal. Now we have some places where you can't social distance. And in those cases, that's where we said, get your masks out, put them on uh, when you can't social distance. But we first and foremost focused on social distancing. Uh, starting this week, actually, we're going to require, and this is, again, based on some of the direction coming from CDC and the government, uh, requiring masks. Uh, right now, we're saying when you can't social distance. Uh, we still believe social distancing is our best uh, option with this. In an industrial environment, if you're not careful with how you use masks, you can, you can create as many problems as you, as you uh prevent if you're not careful. And it's hard to, to wear a mask properly and not touch it and not move it around and all the things you shouldn't do in, in an environment like ours. And I'm sure most of you probably have some of the same, same concerns with it. I don't know where we'll end up with masks. This is a thing we're learning as we go. Uh, but right now, today, we're saying uh, uh, you must have a mask on your person at all times and you must have it on covering your mouth and nose anytime you're within six feet of another person. That, that's the stance we're taking today. And uh, we have not said everyone on site will wear one at all times. We just have some tasks like operating cranes and things where people are very distant from others and a mask creates some hazards if, if we're not very careful. So uh, we're, we're learning as we go on masks. <clears throat> So Van, just as a, give them a sense of the orders of magnitude when we say we have some on supply. Mm -hmm. uh, so procedural math, <laughs> I mean, we're going through a few thousand a day. Uh, procedural mass. Uh, so to the order, I think our stock authorities are for 50,000 or 60,000 of those to be kept in our, in our stores warehouse. When we went into the pandemic, we, we had kept probably 20,000 N95s that we, and probably, I don't know, 90% of those were donated uh, uh, out to uh, hospitals in our surrounding communities in different places. So uh, uh, we will, post pandemic, obviously we'll reevaluate what those numbers need to look like and we'll continue to always stockpile and have those things. They've, they've proved invaluable in a number of cases. Uh, for us. Th those are separate from our normal stock I and mean, we have a storage process where we keep masks and we use them for our process to protect our people but uh, we, we have a separate pandemic uh, stockpile. Great. Thanks man. Let's talk about quarantine and self-isolation. Uh, it's been a it's been an important part of our strategy to contain and to keep the virus out of the Logan plant as much as possible. Um, so we encourage people who are sick, you know, or exhibiting symptoms to stay home with pay, right? So that's, that's kind, of a, kind of a big deal. And we were not, um, I mean, we, we have a medical team, so we, we do have conversations with people, but uh, we trust that our people have, uh, all, for lots of reasons, um, may need to not be at work. So policies in place, high risk individuals. So we did invite anyone who is who was at a high risk for kind of a bad outcome if they con if they con contracted the COVID virus uh, to raise their hand and go through a medical evaluation and, and so and and to basically stay home and, and self quarantine, self isolate. So we probably have 20 of those people uh, we had well i think we had up to up to in total maybe 24 and a lot of those people because we put so many precautions in place have felt comfortable coming back and um when those people those high-risk people come back off of quarantine it's a full team commitment we sit down with the team that they work with and just ask them are you willing to make these commitments to wear a mask when you're around this individual are you willing to make this commitment to clean your work area three or four times a shift are you willing to make a commitment and so and and the teams are very willing to make those commitments and then 
we just let the people that are on quarantine for high risk know that what we've done and most of them have said yeah I, I, I miss my team I feel like they you know they need me and so they've come back but we've not put any uh, pressure on those people to uh, do that too a couple of other reasons we've done that so people uh, people whose, whose spouses work in healthcare. We have people who are working on the front lines of the COVID-19 response in the healthcare industry, you know, and the most important, and, and, and they're at risk, right? And so they're, they're, they're at risk at home. So we um, actually quarantined all of those people a- until we could do, again, a, a medical evaluation to make sure that the safety precautions were being taken, taken at those medical establishments. We didn't want to assume anything. And so we actually conducted interviews uh, to make sure uh, that our people were safe and that they were being treated safely. And where, and where, they, where they were, there was not a problem and they returned to work. Um, but we have a, a number of people whose um, spouses, uh, family members work in other plants or other areas and then they, they, they have an issue where they're quarantining people at their place. And so we've had requests for people to be quarantined by public health. So um, we've quarantined 110, 115 people yeah. all total. Most of them are back. Most of them are back. But over the process of time, until we could work through and have them work through the issues, ensure that their health is good, we have zero issues with people staying at home and either working from home or just self isolating um, to make sure that they're healthy and safe. And I'll add, this is probably the one thing that's saved the plant from for us yeah. from having active cases in the plant. And I'm sure people are wondering the question, do we have active cases or employees with COVID? Uh, there are two, currently two Logan employees, only two that we've had that have tested positive. Both uh, are related to healthcare facility. They have a spouse or someone who was in healthcare. And in both cases, they let us know early and we were able to quarantine them well before the exposure. So, so we've not had a, a person who's been positive on site at Logan, nor have we had exposure in the plant that we're, that we're aware of. And, and I think the, that is because of being proactive with the quarantine, especially with people who uh, were working, had spouses working in healthcare. Uh, both, both our cases are related to, in, in one way or another, related to someone okay. who was positive working in healthcare. Right. So, right. So um, that, that's been a key part for us in, in learning that at, at first there was some, you know, honestly, everybody thinks about cost and concern. We did too. Uh, what's it going to cost us? But it has, it has saved us so far. <laughs> it has saved us significantly uh, out, uh, the, outweighs what the cost was. Right. I mean, I can remember we, we sit on calls with our associates uh, mm-hmm. as well. And some of those have, you know, eight, 16 plants, you know, and, mm-hmm. There's old Logan's on the call saying, well, we early on, well, we quarantined 16 people mm-hmm. and, and all other plants together didn't quarantine 16 people. And they, what are you doing down there? And like, well, we're trying to keep our people healthy and safe. Right. And um, it, it turns out that we were kind of leaders in that area in terms of taking the immediate precautions. And it's just very fortunate. We're just very fortunate today that we're, nothing is, is bad. And, and so when they debate to Van's point, when we did have someone test positive, they were already on quarantine for several weeks. So um, that worked out really well for us. So the last thing I'll say around this is we do have a response protocol. So any, and, and unfortunately last night we're on the phone and executing those protocols when we have a suspicion or a, a, enough, enough information to say there's a concern there um, that deals with disinfecting the areas contact tracing, quarantine, isolations, communications, all, all those bits are pretty well mapped up, mapped out. Everyone knows what their job is. And so when we hit a situation like we did last night, we, we just were on the phone together. We're on a, a virtual call together and executing the plan. And here we are this morning and everything is good. So, uh, but we do, we do actually, if you hear about plants uh, shutting down you know, because, you know, to deep clean and things like that. It, Logan is, I mean, we're so big. I mean, <laughs> what would cause us to ever shut the entire plant down? But we have shut down, like last night, we shut down a whole process. So, and, and shut it down for the bulk of the shift a while. It took several hours to deep clean and with the misters, the sprayers, the 4M company and the whole, the whole bit. And so until we were certain that it was safe for our people to return to work, we kept those operations down. 
So, yep. so uh, yeah, actually that we're fortunate to have uh, Judy on the call. So um, I'll say a few words, Van, and I'll say a few words about communication, but then turn it over to her. Um, Communications at, at, at Logan, because it's a team-based, and everyone, I think most everyone knows kind of the, the way we are with a team-based organization, the most important thing we can do for our employees is give them information. They make sound business decisions. They're, they're business owners in and themselves. And so it's, it's been long part of our culture that we're hugely transparent with our business results and our you know, business information to our teams. It's vital that they have that. And so it, it really became no different when we hit hit uh, hit this uh, pandemic, right? So uh, we quickly, with Judy's help, my gosh, I'm not sure what we had done without Judy being here. And she just arrived. So has done just a whole host of things for us. So I'll let Judy, is that all right, but Judy to chat through? I think we've got a slide to show some of the things that, uh, that she's done, so. Yes, yeah, so, um... You know, when you when you look at the news and you have so much information about COVID-19 and and there's so many uh, just so much information to, to to sift through, and we wanted to make sure that our employees were up to date and well informed, and especially in the areas that would affect us, our our processes, the organization in general, and our families. So we wanted to make sure that we had the most relevant information out there. Um, and as soon as possible so that they can also feel confident that we're looking out for them, um, not only in our processes and equipment and, and all of that that we can offer, but, but also um, emphasizing a personal accountability for themselves and their families and also their team members, um, especially those who are high risk individuals and, and um, you know, those coming out of quarantine, um, making sure that that uh, we all felt a sense of responsibility for each other. And so from the very beginning, we we wanted to make sure that uh, we were regularly sending out organization wide communication. So we started uh, via email. That was the technology that we had um, available at the time. So um, we created a um, a specific communication around the precautions that Logan Aluminum was going to take around the coronavirus, and then we started to employ different um, different ways of communication, um, videos, having our leadership actually get on video and um, sharing information that they had. Um, and I think, you know, what's important is when your leadership can can get in front of people and and pro and give a, a calm message about what it is that we're doing. It gives our employees and their families just that sense of safety because we wanted them to feel like when they come to Logan, um, it was the safest place on earth at that point. So you know, on top of all the precautions and and the and the uh, pieces of equipment and and PPE that we we're giving them. Um, that we felt strongly about their about their safety that we could also offer them the the the, the self quarantine and self isolation um, options. So um, on the screen you'll see just a couple of examples of the emails that we've sent out, including uh, a video from our plant manager Ken, and we also started a series of of internal podcasts that shared. Um, people's views from different parts of the organization. And because we're working separately, we also wanted to find a way for our employees to feel like they were still all in it together. So, you know, having people see the plant manager's face while giving this message and, and having um, them hear people's voices in our audio uh, podcast allows our employees to feel like they're still together, even if we're working physically apart. Um, we also felt that sharing some good things um, when a lot of the things that you hear outside on the news is, is kind of gloom and doom. We wanted to make sure that people um, realized that there were still really good things that were happening and they could be grateful for. So we started putting out a good things email, highlighting our family members, um, doing, you know, doing the parody um, and uh, our team members still communicating with each other via Microsoft Teams and whatever technology we had on hand. 
Um, we have, we ask for our employees to send in examples of what social distancing looks like in their units, just so they can also inspire others in other units um, to make those right behavior you know, decisions and um, keeping each other safe. So um, I think uh, in the last slide, we also uh, bulleted a, an internet, uh, which pretty much laid out all the most updated information, all the updated guidelines so that there was one source of information that they can go to, to always know that, uh, you know, this is the most current um, guidelines for Logan. Um, and it's consistent with all of the communications that have gone out. And that's one of the things that, that we felt really strongly about is, is that consistent information and distribution. So if we're saying one thing in an email, our, our business unit managers and our team leaders are saying the same thing when they're having their conversations with their team members. Um, and then they can also pick up the same message when they go to the internet page. And that's really important because when you have, um, when people start getting confusing information, they're gonna start um, you know, filling, filling in the gaps by themselves and that may not be the right thing. So, uh, so that is, that is one of, or these are the ways that we've tried to ensure that we're sending the most consistent and correct information out to our employees. Thank you. Drew. You know, one of the things that, that strikes me is that I, I am, I am as certain as I'm sitting here that if you, you know, kind of hung out under a rock and never watched the news and knew absolutely nothing and didn't have conversations about the coronavirus with friends and all you did was read the Logan communications on kind of what's happening with the coronavirus and, and the precautions you need to take, you would have everything you would need to know to keep you and your family healthy and safe. I have zero doubt about that. You've done a phenomenal job, Judy. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. I'll just highlight the one thing we did. You know, we usually have quite an Easter. We have an Easter egg. We have a lot of social things with the with our with our families at Easter, and we couldn't do that this year. We were really saddened about that. So what we did instead was we just we um, actually went through honey baked ham and got everyone a turkey and a pecan pie, and just had it um, shipped to their home. So like fourteen hundred people were able to celebrate Easter with the Logan, Logan Turkey, <laughs> me too, you know? So it was uh, just a phenomenal gesture and it's, it's not, not without significant cost, but it's an investment and it's an investment that pays off in so many ways at Logan, so. And that video, if there's one thing you could put in the chat, it, Judy, if you could put that video, those, the kids, one of the families, they, they, they got together while in quarantine and made a video about washing your hands uh, you know, and keeping yourself healthy and safe. It is cute as a button to watch those girls and their mom. It's, it's great. So thanks for all, all that you've done for us, Judy. It's just been phenomenal. So um, let's see. Uh, community support. So, you know, as Van, Van talked about, we so much we've um, given away with the masks, you know, especially for the healthcare workers in our community, the nursing homes and stuff, who basically gave most of those masks away. Um, the COVID crisis fund, so we did a fund draft for that. We did a food draft for that. We had people out um, helping serve people and deliver food uh, to people. Um, Dan, you, you're pretty connected to that too. You wanna, anything else that you wanted to recall there? I just the, the community supports Logan and you know we've always just wanted to be part of that and engage and support back uh, I think it, on, on the next slide the, the last slide is just kind of a, a summary of lessons learned but one of the things I'll point out that kind of relates to community support is having uh, we have a great relationship with our sheriff's department uh, you know business continues at Logan and the normal everyday things we deal with still happen. Uh, we have lots of visitors, We or not, not visitors, but we have lots of uh, uh, truck drivers and different things. There, there's just lots of needs for support. And I can't say enough uh, the relationship and support we have with our sheriff's department, how they've supported us through various things uh, as we've moved through this. And uh, so community support's just not what we can give. The, the community supports Logan as well too. And we greatly yeah. appreciate all that. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, we really, we really didn't want any healthcare worker in Logan County to not have the PPE to feel safe at their job. I mean, really. It's that, and any, so any need that we had, we responded to rapidly. So, yeah, we'll just wrap with kind of just a general discussion around lessons learned, and we'll just kind of go back and forth. I think, uh, Judy, you're welcome to jump in here. Maybe Kyle, Kyle Hines from Logan may have joined. He, I know he sits on the chamber board. Um, but these are just some of the things that so we talked about preparedness, you know, having a crisis management process in place. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if we would be able to share our template in any way, but if it might be helpful to people, we can sanitize that maybe and even share how you think about pandemic crisis management planning, if that would be helpful to people. I think we could be able to do that. Do you think, Van? I do. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So if you want to see kind of it's a staged process, you know, like six levels, you know, that depending upon what's happening in the in our world, you know, it'll count for any, a number, not just, you know, COVID virus, but a, a number of crises that might come your way. So that's been really critical. The, the one, I'd say the one time we probably didn't think things through fast enough, we were already on it and thinking about it, but we didn't get there quick enough was um, high risk employees, uh, and their return to work process, right? So we were working through, we were quite comfortable that they should stay out until we got prepared. But when it got to starting impacts and people and questions were raised, we're like, well, let's come up with a process that uh, enable those people to come back. And now with the masks uh, really coming into play, um, just really in the last day or two going forward, I think it's it, the safest place you can be is at Logan. That's, that's what we want to be. We want to be the, the safe haven that you can feel you can come to. So being prepared was critical. Yeah, I think one more thing on communication and then uh, we'll, we'll take questions, I guess. But uh, it was, we, Judy also did a good job with, with social media. Uh, it wasn't just Logan employees that wanted information. Their spouses, their families wanted to know that, that, that uh, uh, you know, I guess some Logan employees are kind of like me. I'm not the best at coming home and, and communicating all the good things that are happening at Logan. So we, she, she's uh, been very active on social media and, and uh, putting uh, lots of, I don't know if some of you follow our social media, but, but lots of things out there on good things that are happening and, and really to re, reassure family members that uh, Logan's taking it very seriously. Uh, we're we're going to try to keep the business going and keep people employed, and, but we're going to keep them safe first and foremost. And uh, uh, so she's done a very good job putting, putting stuff out on social media on all of our uh, various formats. So uh, I think that's been very important to help reassure our employees' families. So, You know, and I'll just also highlight, because we've certainly lived this in the last eight weeks or so about be nimble. Like all of the major precautions we put in place have all been kind of a for now, right? Because the world changes in a week in, in this kind of environment. You know, it literally, it's just not the way we normally operate, you know, and make a whole bunch of for now decisions in the production of aluminum cans. But in the, in this world, uh, all of your decisions, you have to be flexible and, and be ready to adapt and, and have our employees appreciate that we are adapting and, and taking every step we can to protect them. And with with that, you know, I think we'll just pause there. This is kind of our last slide. Is there any particular area or uh, you want to hear more about or understand more about what we did or just questions for Van or Judy? Uh, or one thing um, I wanted to ask you guys, this is Karen, um, is when you're working from home with your employees and y'all got a whole lot of them, um, um, one message I want to get out to our small businesses um, smaller businesses is, um, you know, what have you found maybe a few tips or the, to keep productivity at bay and communication at bay with your people working from home? I know that you said you communicate with them regularly through email, but as far as uh, working with, you know, we've got some other industries on the line here. Um, as far as that goes, like, is there any particular thing that you found works extremely well with knowing individual productivity? I know you've got different levels of manager, you know, to help you with that, but is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start on that. So yeah. the first thing we did was offer people a lot of online learning on how to work remote and, and be productive. 
Um, so we did that timing wise, maybe five weeks ago, five or six weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, two weeks ago, we did a working from home, uh, working remotely survey. So we surveyed all of our employees to ask them questions about what are the biggest challenges from working from home? Um, you know, they feel like you're working more hours, less hours, or more productive, less productive. What, what advice would you have for your leaders, you know, and, and how to uh, manage you? And so we shared those survey results back uh, with all of our managers just um, within the last five days or so. And we're queuing up a discussion for that, for how we can continue to effectively lead the organization from working remotely. So we, we just, you know, it, it's a lot of people, it's a big, big thing, but, but every one of us, I would say that I don't know a single manager that doesn't have, we don't, doesn't start their day with a touch point with their people. Yeah, Just a, yeah. good, a good morning chat, right? And that's on, and that's on Microsoft Teams. We've really leaned on Teams a lot. Some are using Zoom, both or whatever way you want to use, but I would be, there are probably very few people at Logan. I'm sure there's some, but there are very few people that if they're scheduled to work that day that they don't have a, a touch point uh, at least daily with their team leaders and or managers. Yep. And I'll say this too, talking about community support. I, I don't know if you look back a year and say we were going to prepare for this a year or two ago, uh, but high speed internet and the advances that have been made by both Logan Telephone, the electric plant board and lots of others have enabled us to stay in contact in ways we would not. I mean, I, I live in Southern Muhlenberg County, uh, you know, low, I have high speed, very fast internet, thanks to Logan Telephone, and just have had it for less than a year. So uh, some of the advances that have been made in our communities recently have absolutely enabled us to do that better. Uh, an example, I, you know, I have a, a daily call with my, with my leaders, uh, and they have daily, daily calls with their teams. So we, you know, Logan's been very good at setting goals and, and expectations. And we're still moving forward with those things. We're just having to alter and do them a little bit differently. So, uh, so we're 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 making sure that you know through our current structure that we're having team meetings, we're having project meetings. All those things are happening virtually, just like they would if we were all sitting there. As a matter of fact, whenever we do get to go back to work, uh, I'd say we're probably changed somewhat forever, and that we will use this technology much more going forward than we ever have especially in this startup period, even if we're sitting at work, we're not going to be piled up in a conference room. That's not going to happen. So, uh, so we may be at work, but we're also going to be looking at screens for a while uh, on, on some level. Right. One of the things that um, I, I forgot to bring up during the communication portion was we started to employ um, a digital signage program across plant site. Um, it's called net presenter. It allows us to push out information on monitors throughout the plant. Um, we're rolling out more monitors as we speak. Um, but the option, you know, to have um, messages play as a screensaver on everyone's uh, computer or laptop um, is available. And also it, it gives a it gives a mobile app option as well. And so while we're just starting to roll that out, we've been able to use some of that new um, digital signage technology and some of the older digital signage technology that we had been currently using to get information out, especially for our deskless workers um, who are not in front of a computer um, all, you know, all day. So um, that way they're receiving the same information um, that people get through email on those screens um, when they're when they're in the plant. Thank you, guys. Um, and for one final question for me, um, as you know, May 11th approaches. I know one of the questions that people are starting to think about. You know, the governor's asking everybody to do 50%. You know, capacity and things like that. But um, as far as that goes, what does that look like for you guys as far as your work from home staff? Are y'all just going to start rolling in, you know, at that point, yeah, a that, certain group? It, what does it, that look like? It, it, it's a good question when we actually have talked about this morning. Uh, uh, we uh, no, it won't go back to normal with the flip of a switch for us. It will certainly be a phased approach. Logan is considered a, an essential business. So, so you know, we'll, we'll keep operations first and foremost. 
Uh, we will prioritize staff who are working our operations area before administrative staff. And we will slowly uh, have some targets. Uh, I would say most people will come back on site on some regular basis, but uh, we will have targets. You know, we, we have a pretty good system that lets us know real time exactly how many people are on our site. Uh, and we'll be able to set some targets uh, and we'll have a, we'll have a process that it is, you know, we can react to what's happening, but uh, right now we're talking about a six to eight week process uh, that slowly starts to bring some of our uh, teleworkers back to the plant. So, and if things change in the community, we'll, we'll adjust. <laughs> so, right. Just so thinking like, about, I'm sorry, go ahead. So say like, uh, just to give you an example in my area, we talked about that this morning as well, even before we talked about it with the managers, my team talked about it. And, uh, you know, we have an, an HR representative and a nurse on, on site every day, and that's it. Uh, no, nothing more than that. We don't have our benefits people or our talent development people on site. Um, in, a, in about two weeks, they'll start to, I mean, the talent team is four people. Maybe one of them will start coming in, you know, so there'll be somebody there each day. So we'll slowly and gradually and then increase that to two. And, you know, it's social distancing is, is absolutely, we all know, is the key to keeping that curve flattened and, and we're keeping our outcomes, you know, in the way that we want them in a, in a good way. And so we don't want to do anything. We want to just kind of be cautious and then react, see how that goes, see if it presents challenges. But we will, it's a band set. It's probably six weeks, eight weeks at the most process, I would think. Did anyone have any final questions for Logan? I didn't have any chats coming through, so. Um, I just want to say as a, and interrupt me if you do, but I just want to remind everybody if you came on the call late that this call has been, has been recorded, uh, so it will be published as well uh, for the community. Just want to say a huge thank you to Logan Aluminum. I know listening to, just like Judy was saying earlier, listening to everything that's been going on that's put out in the public, it's so nice to hear from a local, um, such a large industry on how you guys are being proactive in implementing these things and making them a reality for the people of Logan County um, and beyond because of how many people don't live in Logan County that work at Logan. But um, I just wanna say a big thank you for all that you do, all that you've invested in the community. Um, all I've had to do, I've been messaging back and forth with Logan and all I've had to do is say, here's a need and um, next thing I know it's been delivered. So I just wanna say thank you guys. I appreciate your time and your investment today uh, spending with us. Yeah. Very good. Uh, and I'll, I'll just last comment for me, but we certainly are learning every day. So please, if you have uh, suggestions or ideas or things that you're doing in your business that we're not, uh, we, we, we would love to hear from the community and help us grow and get better. That's, that's what we're about. And I want to thank everybody who's on. There's so many people that have been so important to Logan on this call and friends of Logan in so many ways. So we appreciate your interest in, in what's, going, what's going on at Logan. More to come. We have many more exciting things to talk about. Hopefully not just about this stuff, but we've got some other great ideas and great plans that we look forward to sharing as the summer months move on. That sounds awesome. We'll look forward to it. Hey, you guys have a blessed day, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Right. Go cards. <laughs>